Good morning. We'll get started. We'll mark the roll. I'm Utah Representative Jim Dunnigan. I'll be chairing the meeting today. May I have a motion to waive the quorum requirements? Is there a second? I'll place the motion. All in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. Let's consider the minutes of J July 22nd, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Second? It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of July 22nd, 2023. All in favor say aye. Opposed say Motion carries. Before we get started, just a quick reminder, if there's anyone in the audience that would like to provide testimony, you can fill out a slip on the table, a testimony slip, and give it to either myself or to Will. First on our agenda is a presentation on ERISA. As many of you know, NCOIL has been on record in advocating for ERISA reforms in an effort to provide states with more ability to regulate the state healthcare marketplace. Starting on page 360 in your binders, you can find an ERISA waiver concept that NCOIL has endorsed, followed by a resolution that NCOIL has adopted advocating for amendments to ERISA. With us here today is Bill Copley, who will deliver a presentation on the latest developments surrounding ERISA, and he will speak to how we as state legislators can enact laws to avoid ERISA preemption. We'll hold our questions until Bill is finished. Bill, welcome, go ahead. Good morning and thank you for the introduction. I'm here today to talk about ERISA preemption. And I think when a lot of people think about ERISA, they, they think of a highly technical statute with complex requirements. But I'm really here today to talk about a, a, a simple and fundamental issue, which is to what extent can states continue to exercise their traditional authority to legislate and enforce laws in the areas of insurance and healthcare. And it's an important issue. There is a prevailing understanding out there that I think is not quite right, that any state law in those areas cannot be applied to a self-funded ERISA plan. And I think that comes from a fundamental misunderstanding of ERISA preemption, particularly as it's been interpreted recently by the Supreme Court of the United States in a case called Rutledge v. PCMA. I'd like to start out, I, I expect you guys know a fair amount about ERISA, but I'd like to start out with just discussing some basic principles so that we're all on the same page. So what is ERISA? ERISA is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. And it's a federal statute that creates a uniform set of rules for the administration of employee benefit plans sponsored by companies and unions. Congress's goal when it enacted the, the statute was to, uh, to protect employers from having to comply with 50 different states and 50 different sets of requirements in setting up benefit plans for their employees. ERISA sets standards um, in a couple of areas. It requires sponsors to act in the best interest of the plan beneficiaries, also known as fiduciary duties. It requires the administrators the sponsors hire to run the plans to also act as fiduciaries. It requires reporting requirements, information that the plans have to give both to the federal government and to beneficiaries. It sets standards for who is eligible to participate in a plan. And it establishes funding levels to make sure that whatever benefits the plan promises, it actually has the resources to deliver. What ERISA does not do, however, is dictate that a plan provide any particular benefit. So what is ERISA preemption? Again, Congress's goal when it set up ERISA was to protect plans from having to comply with a patchwork of 50 different state laws when setting up the plans. I've got the, the actual language from the statute in the PowerPoint. But essentially what the statute says is that, that ERISA preempts state laws that relate to any employment benefit, benefit plan. And courts have really struggled with this language and they've noticed, noted that it's unhelpful. And the reason is because the, the phrase relates to is, is subject to interpretation. At a certain level of abstraction, everything in the universe relates to everything else. So they've tried to come up with formulas, formulations to um, understand and give substance to that. And they've said that a state law relates to an employment benefit plan in two different ways. 
One, it can refer to an ERISA plan, which means that a state law singles out ERISA plans for different treatment. It also can have a connection with an ERISA plan. And connection with focuses not on what the state law says, but on what it does. And the, the, uh, the courts have ruled that a state law has a connection with a plan if it regulates a central matter of plan administration, which it notes are things like dictating what benefits a plan must provide, or dictating who can be a benefit, or dictating you know, different or duplicative reporting requirements to states in addition to what the federal government requires. Those have, said, those have been examples of what courts have said and the Supreme Court have said ERISA preemption prohibits. Now, the preemption clause also contains an exception for state laws that regulate insurance. And I think this is where some of the misconception about insurance laws not being able to apply to self-funded plans come from. So what does the insurance exception preserve? The insurance exception applies only if the law would be preempted under the statute's relates to test. And there are two parts to the insurance exception. One is that the, the, the general exception, which says that a state law that regulates insurance won't be preempted. And the other is called the Deamer Clause, which says that a self-funded plan will not be deemed to be an insurance company for purposes of this exception. So what does it mean? What is a state law that regulates insurance? There's two parts to that. One is that it must target insurance companies. And the second is the law must substantially affect the risk pooling arrangement between the insurer and the insured. The insurance exception saves the state law regulating insurance under ERISA, but importantly, that's only if the law is preempted in the first instance. That is, that the, that the court finds that it relates to um, an ERISA plan. Um, and so I think this is where we're, we get into, um, this is where we get into you know, some of the misconceptions because um, ERISA preemption impacts um, insurance laws in a number of ways because you've got organizations that will work with legislators to pass laws that are good for patients and providers. Laws like laws regulating assignment of benefits, laws requiring insurers to honor prior authorizations, and, law, and laws limiting retroactive denials of benefits. And the insurance companies that manage, the, manage self-funded plans will simply ignore these statutes and under the assumption that they cannot apply to self-funded plans. And so I think it's important to understand sort of what is the state of the law because in many cases that's not correct. And it's not correct under the Supreme Court's recent decision, Rutledge v. PCMA. So why is this decision so important? It's important because the Supreme Court clarified the types of laws that ERISA preempts, and it rejected some of the broad interpretations of ERISA preemption. And this is important because, as I said before, the insurance exception, where it matters whether or not a plan is self-funded, that only applies if ERISA preempts the statute in the first instance. And Rutledge is a case about whether or not a statute is preempted in that first instance. And in that case, the court rejected several broad interpretations of ERISA preemption that had been percolating in some of the courts of appeals. One of them was an argument that if a statute applies generally to, to benefit plans, that that inherently is a reference to ERISA plans. And they rejected that, saying, no, that refers to will only trigger preemption if you're singling out an ERISA plan for different treatment. It also clarified, though, that ERISA preemption under the connection with part only fo should focus on whether state laws interfere with plan administration itself by dictating benefits, by determining who can or must be a beneficiary, or by regulating in an area that ERISA already regulates itself. A state law that passes this Rutledge test means that you never look at whether or not, it doesn't matter whether or not it's a law regulating insurance, and it doesn't matter whether or not the law is being applied to a self-funded plan, because the law is not regulated in the first instance. So what was at issue at Rutledge? I think understanding the decision, in understanding the decision, it's helpful to understand what the Supreme Court was actually looking at. Um, and the issue there was whether ERISA preempted Act 900, which was an Arkansas law that basically did two things. It said that pharmacy benefit managers must pay pharmacies 
the cost for that they their wholesale cost when they dispense generic drugs. The problem was uh, one called negative reimbursements, where PBMs were paying pharmacies less than what the pharmacy had to pay to get the drug in the first place. The law also importantly created enforcement mechanisms, including requiring PBMs to set up an appeal process that where pharmacists could challenge the reimbursement rates they were being paid. The court ruled 8-0, it was a unanimous decision, that ERISA did not preempt the Arkansas statute. It held that ERISA only preempts state laws that dictate benefits or eligibility determinations or that regulate an area that ERISA already regulates. A state law that regulates third-party service providers generally does not refer to ERISA plans. It also does not, ERISA also doesn't preempt cost regulations or regulations that only have a de minimis um, impact on plan administration. So what are the key takeaways? Well, Rutledge addressed whether or not the state law relates to an ERISA plan, and that's the first step in the analysis. So again, we're the, the Rutledge analysis doesn't depend on whether or not a plan is self-funded. And it made clear that a state law that regulates benefit, benefits plans generally without treating employee plans differently does not refer to an ERISA plan. And that ERISA does not preempt laws that merely a change of plans costs or incentives or the, or the way that it participates as a market participant. And it specifically does not preempt regulations that only impact costs or what, or what a plan pays. So, how have courts applied Rutledge? Because I think it's important now that, now that the Supreme Court has spoken, you know, how, how, how are the lower courts interpreting it? And there's been two decisions. One was PCMA v. Wiebe in the Eighth Circuit, and that case involved some similar uh, restrictions on pharmacies and how PBMs uh, interacted with them, and it hewed very closely to Rutledge. It said generally that these regulations are regulations of healthcare and insurance about how PBMs pay pharmacists and that they do not relate to central matters of plan administration. The second case that has come out has been from the Tenth Circuit in PCMA v. Mulready. And Mulready took a very different approach. Mulready said that ERISA, despite Rutledge, does not only preempt state laws regarding plan administration, but it goes much further and preempts state laws that govern benefit design. And the, 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 the problem with that analysis is it's, it's very broad. What that means is that if ERISA preempts how benefits are provided, it essentially preempts the entire field of insurance healthcare regulation as it applies to self-funded um, plans. And so these decisions conflict, and the Tenth Circuit specifically said that it was disagreeing with the Eighth Circuit, which creates a circuit split in the United States. And so it, the, it's created the situation where ERISA preemption actually applies differently in the states within the Tenth Circuit, which are Oklahoma, Kansas, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah, than it applies in the rest of the country. So what's going to happen going forward? The ability of states to regulate and to exercise their traditional authority in the field of insurance and healthcare is going to be impacted by how this circuit split is resolved. Um, I expect the resolution is going to come in the next one to two years. The Tenth Circuit is currently considering a request by the state of Oklahoma to rehear the case, what's called en banc. The way the courts of appeals work is that generally a case is decided by a three-judge panel, and then the losing party can request that the court, all of the judges that sit on the court, hear the case and decide as a full court. And the Tenth Circuit has actually requested that the PCMA respond to that petition, so I think that shows that there is some serious consideration of that. But if the Tenth Circuit doesn't reverse this decision, I expect this is going to be a significant issue that the Supreme Court's going to take up again, because again, you've got... ERISA and ERISA preemption being applied very differently in different parts of the country. So um, how does Rutledge impact state re insurance regulation? Assuming that, that you know, my reading of Rutledge is correct and that the Eighth Circuit's reading of Rutledge is correct, it means that states have a lot more authority to enact laws and enforce them, including against self-funded plans, than has traditionally been thought. That when you're dealing with matters that um, don't go to central plan administration, but are just about how benefits are being provided. Those laws should be enforceable generally, regardless, because they don't rely on the insurance exception, 
And so that means it doesn't matter whether or not a plan is self-funded or not. And examples of state laws that many have, have been enacted by many of the states here, but that aren't currently being enforced potentially against self-funded plans are laws that require insurers to allow assignment of benefits out of network, laws that um, regulate retroactive denials of claims after they've been paid, and laws that require insurers to honor pre-authorizations. So those are just a few examples, we think, of, of laws where those laws are not currently being enforced consistently throughout the states, and we think that states actually are well within their authority to apply those laws to all benefit plans, whether or not they're self-funded. Thank you, and I'm here for any questions you may have. Thank you. I would appreciate that presentation. We'll open it up to now to questions. We'll go first to Representative Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am a representative from Arkansas, and we actually had a bill before Rutledge that didn't hold up in court, and we came back and wrote it, and that wrote a new bill for PBMs, and that's what ended up the Rutledge decision. I guess my question is, looking at the Oklahoma Mulready uh, bill, is there something they could do to alter that law and represent it that might be upheld? Uh, or, or all those provisions, I think they have like network ad adequacy and contracting and any willing provider, I, it's my understanding, is what's in the bill. Yeah, so the Mulready, uh, just so everyone's on the same page, the Oklahoma bill that was at issue at Mulready um, primarily dealt with pharmacy density requirements, requirements that when, when the plans put together, when the PBMs for the plans put together a network of pharmacists, that that, like, certain thresholds, like 90% of the beneficiaries in an urban area had to be within two miles of an in-network pharmacy. And in suburban areas, they had to be within five miles. And in rural areas, they had to be within 15 miles. So that was sort of a simplification of, of sort of the general thrust of the statute. As far as could it have been rewritten, um, under the Tenth Circuit's analysis, I don't think so, because the Tenth Circuit analysis basically took a very broad view that any statute impacting how benefits are provided by plans is preempted. So I don't think there's anything that you could have done given the breadth of the Tenth Circuit. I think if that same statute had come up in the Eighth Circuit post-Rutledge, the case would have come out the other way, and I think that's true in most other circuits as well. So, you know, when I look at Mulready, it's not necessarily that I look at how the statute was drafted and I say there was some flaw there that triggered a risk of preemption. It's more that I think that the Tenth Circuit's analysis took a way on how broad a risk of preemption is, viewed that far too broadly, and I think it's out of step with the Rutledge decision. But we're going to find out whether or not I'm right or wrong in the next couple of years. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Senator Hackett. I appreciate and I appreciate the, uh, the talk on preemption. You know, I'm really concerned in Ohio uh, on the two to 50 book of business. When I've been in the business a long time and it used to be people wouldn't move to self-insured ERISA plans unless they had 500, then 250, then 100. We're seeing a lot of groups that are moving between two and 50 to ERISA groups, self-insured groups. And the reason is in the old days, if they had a bad problem with the ERISA group and they tried to get back in the, the public insured plans, they would get hammered, you know, because of the claims they hit a bad year. But now, in, you know, it's community rated 2 to 50, so they can play both sides. So my concern, I mean, is that that book of business from 2 to 50, the regular fully insured that we oversee, the, that book of business, you know, a lot of it's going to MIWAs and association plans. You know, how, how do we protect? And, and I understand what pre preemption does, but it still doesn't block companies, because you can come right back in, they don't ask health questions. So they don't know that somebody went to a RISA plan, had bad claim experience, they didn't know they were going to, but they did, they came right back in and, and, got, and get better rates than probably they should get and they bring down. And so that book of business from two to 50, is gonna get worse and worse. So do you, will you comment on that? Because that's what worries me in Ohio. Well, I, I'm not sure that, that I'm, I'm in a position to comment on sort of the movement back and forth between the plans. The one thing I would say is that the more consistently the law is apply, applied between self-funded plans and insured plans, right? Like, that removes a lot of the incentive for those plans to operate differently. 
And I think that sort of uniform enforcement of the law can only help improve that situation. Yeah, you know what our authority is in Ohio? And George had to leave, but you know what our authority is in Ohio? It used to be in the mid to upper teens. You know, I just, it's 12%. So the rest of the plans are under, rest of the people are under ERISA plans, which we have some authority because of preemption and that'll get resolved. But you can see the problem on that. We're, we're losing and the, and the ones that are staying is not a good book of business. Right. Thank you, Senator. So I have a, a question for you to follow up on Senator Hackett. In your opinion, could a state say these uh, ERISA plans or these level funded plans are not allowed in a, mar in a state's marketplace between two and 50, that they have to do community rating or that they are allowed, but that they have to do community rating? You know, I, I, to be honest, I don't think that's an ERISA preemption issue. I don't think ERISA preemption has anything to say about that topic. So a state, in your opinion, could say a group plan between two and 50 employees needs to use community rating. Well, I, I, I'd have to, to be honest with you, I'm not sufficiently versed in that particular law to give an opinion on whether or not that would pass a risk of preemption. I'd need to look at the law. See, Jim, Jim how, the, how they get out now, they go to MIWA as an association, which puts them in a much larger group, and then that larger group goes to the ERISA plans, and they can ask health questions, as, as you know, under that scenario. And so they, they know that they're a very healthy group, but how can, you, how can you stop access to somebody to a MIWA or an association plan? That's really, even though their company is under 50. I don't know. One other question. You listed three things that a state could not regulate. The benefits, uh, if it's covered, regulated by ERISA. But how do you determine what's regulated by ERISA? Because to me, it kind of says you can't regulate that if it's regulated by ERISA. What's defined what's regulated by ERISA? Well, I, I think that would be the statute itself and the implementing regulations by the Department of Labor, right? What, what topics do those specifically cover? If, if ERISA specifically covers that topic, then I think it's a, there's a good argument that those are matters of central plan administration that the states cannot regulate. An example would be, there was a case um, from 2006 to the Supreme Court called the Gobiel decision. And in that case, the state of Vermont tried to enact its own reporting requirements um, that were similar but different from the types of information that ERISA plans are required to report to the federal government. And the court there said, because the, the ERISA itself has reporting requirements, the, that any attempt by the states to impose similar or different requirements is preempted. And that was a 7-2 that was a decision, I believe, with Justices Sotomayor and Ginsburg dissenting. And um, judges, Justices Sotomayor and Ginsburg would have, would have even allowed that. They wanted even narrower. ERISA preemption, but the, the court did rule that that was sort of a paradigmatic example of states trying to do something where ERISA is already operating in that space. Thank you. Any other questions? Bill, thank you very much. It's been informative. Um, I think one of at least my challenges for decades now, we've been told ERISA prevents all this state regulation. You can't do it. You can't do it. And we've just kind of accepted that. And now the Supreme Court ruling has pierced that to some degree. We're trying to figure out what that degree is. But thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we do have uh, a speaker from the audience, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, Miranda Motter, uh, Senior Vice President uh, with uh, AHIP. Just a, a quick comment. Uh, so appreciate the um, focus and opportunity to spend a few minutes on uh, preemption and certainly um, from our perspective, the importance um, of preemption for employers in all of your communities has been said um, you know many of the employers in many of your states all across this country um, are desperately continue to look for affordable health care coverage and uh, the protections under ERISA preemption uh, give them uniformity 
it gives them stability. It gives them an opportunity to continue to provide affordable health care to all the employees in your states. And so from a policy perspective, I would uh, you know, just continue to caution as um, you know, um, constituencies continue to make sure that there is viable, affordable health care in your markets, uh, that state policymakers look at the, this issue and um, really extending state laws um, that in our perspective um, are really um, overextending um, state's authority, but just making sure that um, we're not continuing to put additional pressure um, on employers um, so that they end up in a situation where they're unable to provide their employees um, health care, affordable health care. So thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Any other final comments? Bill, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Thank you. Next on our agenda is a presentation of recent FEMA and NFIP initiatives. Today we have David Marstead of FEMA. David, thank you for joining us. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be here, especially after the 27th short-term reauthorization of the NFIP uh, this week. Uh, I truly appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here at NCOIL's annual meeting, especially as a former state senator from, uh, from Nebraska. NCOIL is a valued partner uh, to FEMA and the NFIP in helping to get the word out to Americans about their flood risk and the importance of purchasing a flood insurance policy. And I truly consider all of you a part of the NFIP's movement to close the flood insurance gap and reduce disaster suffering. I especially want to recognize and appreciate the concrete actions you are taking, including your recent fly-in to the Hill where you advocated for a multi-year reauthorization of the NFIP to members of Congress. We know these short-term extensions and the uncertainty they bring are not good for the program and not good for our policyholders, especially right now given the climate crisis that is making storms more frequent and more severe. And from where we, from where we sit uh, in Ohio, it might be easy to think this is just about something for coastal areas to worry about. But inland flooding is real, and the Midwest is no exception. This July, a, a storm dumped nearly nine inches of rain within 12 hours over Chicago, while the Chicago River rose by six feet, damaging over 2,000 homes and resulting in a presidential major disaster declaration. And in August, heavy rains pounded the mid-Ohio Valley, causing flooding and damaging multiple homes and apartments. It's a good reminder for the Midwest that where it can rain, it can flood. And when these kinds of disasters hit, far too few survivors have the peace of mind and the financial protection provided by uh, flood insurance. And we know the flood, in, uh, flood protection gap is uh, felt most by folks in disadvantaged communities who have often been pushed into high-risk areas because of years of discriminatory land use planning and systemic inequity. And to underline that point, the U.S. Census Bureau estimates that 30 million black Americans were displaced due to a natural disaster last year. Folks, this is the kind of disaster suffering we need to confront. And that's why FEMA is so determined to break the rinse and repeat cycle of disaster recovery in this country and replace it with more insured survivors and more resilient individuals and communities against the perils of flooding. So with that in mind, today I want to share what we're doing under our own authority to transform the NFIP and close the flood insurance gap. Some of you may be familiar with the NFIP through your work, but for those who aren't, I have a brief uh, overview. We like to think of the NFIP as a four-legged stool. The first leg is mitigation grants, which can be used by communities to fund eligible mitigation measures that reduce disaster losses by targeting repetitive loss properties. The second leg is flood hazard mapping and risk identification, which can be uh, which can be used by communities to determine which areas have the highest risk of flooding. Now, I want to be clear, these maps are not predictive. They cannot tell us where or when or how much it will rain. This is uh, sometimes misinformation you may read in the press, 
Rather, they help communities make informed decisions about how to best protect lives and property, plan development, and make infrastructure improvements to manage or reduce flood risk. The third leg uh, is flood management. It's used by communities to manage risk in the special flood hazard area. This can include zoning, building codes, education, and other efforts to help communities adopt and enforce higher standards to both minimize harm and preserve the natural and beneficial function and value of floodplains. And finally, we have the fourth leg, flood insurance, which is used to protect against the financial impacts from flood disasters. As you know, a flood insurance policy is required for homes that have government-backed mortgages in designated high-risk areas. But the reality is, and this may surprise, uh, this surprises many, that uh, a lot of our claims, almost 30% a year, come from outside the special flood hazard area. And from where I sit as the head of the National Flood Insurance Program, despite the growing threat, flooding remains a woefully underappreciated risk. Let's take a look at this map of penetration rates here where we sit in FEMA Region 5. They're far, far lower than what they need to be given our new normal, and it's not just the Midwest. Only 4%. I know you all know this, it's starting to feel like a broken record, but nationwide only uh, about 4% of homeowners inside and outside the special flood hazard area have flood insurance. Nearly, uh, nearly all U.S. counties have experienced some level of a flood event, which makes sense because according to the Insurance Information Institute, 90% of U.S. catastrophes involve flooding. Thankfully, it's not all gloom and doom, even as some insurance companies have made the decision to pull out of areas of the country with the highest impact from climate change. The private uh, flood insurance market overall now accounts for a bigger piece of a growing pie, to quote a recent report from the Insurance Information Institute. As you can see on the screen, in 2016, 12.6 percent of flood coverage was written by 18 private companies. Fast forward to 2022 and 32.1 percent of flood coverage was written by 77 private companies, an overall increase of 24 percent. For whatever reason, we're glad to see it. We've encouraged, uh, for years, encouraged private insurers to share in the nation's flood risk, and there's plenty of room in the market for, uh, for options. After all, the goal is to close the flood, the flood insurance gap, so we have more insured survivors and less disaster suffering. So I won't quibble how we get there. That in mind, let me pivot to some of the work uh, we're doing to transform the NFIP. I'll start with our modern rating approach. As of April 1st of this year, our full book of business, that's roughly 4.7 million policies in force across 22,600 participating communities is now being rated under risk rating 2.0. Under this approach, every policyholder now pays for their own flood risk, not someone else's. And as a reminder, a significant aspect that doesn't seem to generate much attention is reduced premiums for some policyholders. Under legacy rating, 23%, nearly 1 million policyholders were paying more than their full risk rate. Low value property owners were subsidizing high value property owners. The current pricing uh, approach charges these policyholders only their fair share of risk resulting in significant savings for these policyholders. For policyholders who are experiencing increases under the modern rating approach, these increases are distributed gradually, not suddenly, as most premium increases are capped by Congress at 18 percent, meaning these policyholders will be on a glide path to reach their full risk rate. We estimate that 95% of policyholders will reach their full risk rate by 2037, or longer for those policy who were previously mispriced and discounted the most. The next initiative I'll highlight is something our stakeholders have been requesting for a while. Not only has risk rating simplified the process for insurance agents to generate quotes for potential customers and renew policies for current customers, but we're also researching other options to reduce barriers to purchasing flood insurance. And that includes how we can make installment plans work so that our policyholders have the option to make manageable monthly payments. 
I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Community Rating System, or CRS, but for those who aren't, CRS is a voluntary incentive program that rewards communities who participate in mitigation activities that reduce flooding. Those rewards show up in the form of discounted flood insurance premiums for policyholders in CRS communities. We're look, currently looking at how we can improve the program through our CRS Next initiative, focusing on making access and participation in the program simpler, more equitable, and feasible for all communities. And of course, we're working with our stakeholders every step of the way. These are a sample of some of the things the NFIP is doing to meet the urgency of the moment under our own authority. So now, on to what we need Congress to act on to keep the transformation train moving forward. First and foremost is a long-term reauthorization of the NFIP. If we are to build an enduring NFIP that lasts for generations, we need Congress to pass a 10-year reauthorization of the NFIP, something we've proposed with the support of the Biden administration. Now, along with a longer multi-year reauthorization, we've proposed a set of 17 legislative reforms as part of our strategy to set the NFIP up for long-term success. They're spelled out on, uh, in detail on FEMA.gov, which I encourage you to visit, but I'll highlight uh, a few here. The first is affordability, which is the most significant barrier to accessing flood insurance, and one of FEMA's recommendations addresses this critical factor. We know from the research that too many families are being forced to prioritize putting food on the table over purchasing a policy, which is why FEMA engaged the broader, broader policy community, including academia and other government agencies, and developed an affordability framework that was delivered to Congress in 2018. Moreover, NFIP's uh, ins flood insurance means-tested assistance legislative proposal has been included in the administration's 22, 23, and FY24 budgets. But let me be clear, absent legislative authority, FEMA is constrained in its ability to offer more affordable premium rates to those who need it. As they say, the ball is in Congress court. To achieve our affordability goal, the NFIP must have a sound financial framework. As you probably know, when disasters exceed the NFIP's capacity to pay, Congress has repeatedly raised the NFIP's borrowing authority rather than address this structural flaw of the program. The NFIP is currently saddled with $20.525 billion in debt at an average interest rate of 3.02 percent Every day, the NFIP accrues $1.7 million in interest on its debt. As future notes mature and are refinanced at higher interest rates, the NFIP's debt service will only grow and become an ever-increasing drain on the program. This is why debt cancellation is integral to getting the NFIP's financial house in order. So clearly, there's a lot riding on, on, on Congress. And so as I wrap up, uh, my goal today was to give you a snapshot of some of the work uh, we're doing to transform the NFIP. And while we're making an important progress, there's still a long road ahead of us to close the flood insurance gap. And this is where the power of relationships really matter. We continue to build those relationships with realtors, lenders, private insurance companies, local elected officials, community advocates, and various associations like NCOIL. These are the trusted voices in communities that can share, uh, that can change the hearts the, uh, relative to the importance of having a flood insurance policy. Because we can't do it alone, uh, there's so much more at, at stake. So I would just ask you to use your spheres of influence so that you can per persuade your uh, individuals in your communities, your constituents, of the importance and the need of uh, flood insurance protection and, and mitigation, and continue to help us build uh, momentum to our movement to build a resilient nation and reduce disaster suffering. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to what questions you may have. David, thank you very much. Now we'll open it up to legislators for questions or comments. Are there any? We have Representative Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I want to preface what I'm about to say 
with no, uh, this is not insulting to you, David, or to, to NFIP pretty much the whole, but it is getting extremely frustrating to have NFIP come every year, and all I hear is we've accumulated more debt. To, to your point, and, and, and you, you, you were accurate, you're $20 billion in debt. In 2017, you're $25 billion in debt, and, and Congress canceled $16 billion of that so you could pay claims. Are we on the path of Congress canceling more debt, as you said, we, that needs to happen? You've got to pay claims, right? Mm -hmm. this, the long-term solution, you use the term a long-term solution. I don't know if Congress's definition of long-term is anything more than 60 days or six months. or Long-term solution has to be a long-term solution. And we've argued for some time that the private market needs to engage in this. And as you pointed out, the private market in, in percentages have increased but I think you're still going to have a segment that will never engage in the private market, the private market will never engage in. We've asked Congress, why would you not look at this similar to how you handled, the government handled TRIA, where you said, we know you can't handle a Hurricane Katrina, but you can handle a flood in Ohio and in Indiana, but you don't want to take that risk because you've got, you'd be on the hook for a Katrina. So we'll be your backstop. Okay, but we're not going to be that first dollar. Do you think the, the, the carriers would engage in filling that gap if they knew what their, literally what their stop loss would be? Then you're not going to be $20 billion in debt. TRIA is funded. Now, we haven't had any terrorist activity. But it, the bottom line is policyholders are paying for TRIA. It's being, it works. It's, to me, it seems like a logical example of where government can work with the private market but there doesn't seem to want to be any discussions on that. We go to Congress every year on our fly-in, and we bring this up, and it's like, hey, that's a, that's a darn good idea, but nobody does anything other than we've got to reauthorize NFIP. We'll do it for another three months, another six months. In the meantime, what is the long-term solution? And, and, and we've got uh, – it's, it's Fed's got to gauge. That's number one. But what can we do at our end – to, to, not, to have you come back and say, you know what, things are getting better instead of it's the same old, same old, and actually financially it's getting worse. So my, my challenge is what can we do to make this better? Yeah, a couple comments first. Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the NFIP is essentially a residential uh, flood insurance program, and, and the program still writes about 96 percent of all residential flood insurance coverage that's provided currently in the, in the, in the, uh, in the country. On the debt, uh, your figures are spot on. We were successful in 2016 of being able to have uh, 16 billion dollars of the, of the debt canceled so that that wouldn't saddle current policyholders to pay interest on a debt that was accumulated by federally backed uh, claims that were paid in the past violates actuarial principles for one. I think it's morally reprehensible, uh, number two. The program that Congress decided back after Katrina that unlike every other disaster program across the federal government space, for one, there's a, an event that exceeds the amount of dollars appropriated for that year, they pass a supplemental appropriation for that amount. The NFIP is the uh, uh, unfortunately, a distinction from, uh, from that practice. The big problem with why the program continues to uh, have its challenges is because people don't understand how it's funded. The policyholders cannot fund the entire cost of the program because in addition to the insurance that they receive, there's also a mitigation grant program, a flood hazard mapping program, and a flood, uh, as I indicated in my uh, comments, floodplain management program that benefit all the citizens of the, of the country. The program, the policyholders themselves can't fund the program themselves because our program violates a key principle of insurance, and that's concentration of risk. Private sector companies can spread the risk throughout a state, a country, and, and underwrite to the standards that they set. The NFIP, on the other hand, regardless of where a property is, regardless of the loss experience of that property, if that property is in one of our 22,600 communities, we provide a policy. So we have very 
a concentrated risk that the policyholders themselves cannot, uh, cannot bur uh, have the full burden on. So our proposal for developing a sound financial framework is to address this and transparently show that, listen, the taxpayers need to participate in part of this program, and here's how they can, here's how they can do it. There's three things that we propose. Uh, first is that we cancel the debt, so the current 600, roughly $600 million of interest could be used for the benefit of the program and the, and the current policyholders. Second, we say hold the program accountable for a loss exceedance level, annual level of a, of a 1 in 20 year loss exceedance uh, event. Roughly now that's about $11 billion. If an event exceeds that amount, the administrator of FEMA would be required to request the additional amount over and above that from, uh, from Congress in a supplemental appropriation. The third key part is what we're calling an equalization payment. The actuaries say we're supposed to, I'll just use, we're supposed to collect $10. Because of the uh, limitations that Congress has placed on the program relative to our rating structure and our cap on increasing premiums only 18% of the year, we're only able to collect about $7.50. So program is, is recommending with the support of the uh, administration that if you want to provide this level of benefit, that's great, just fund it. And so we uh, request annual appropriation for that difference uh, on, on an annual basis. What can you do? You can do the same thing that you've, that you've been doing. And that's expressed the need for a sound financial structure that is transparent, that shows what the policyholders can pay, what the taxpayers need to be paid for, and to do it for, we say, at least a 10-year period so the program can have the stability to put in place the recommendations, the transformative recommendations that we've, uh, that the subject matter experts have, have brought forward. Okay, thank, thank you. So we've still got one more item on the agenda. We have two more legislators. First we'll go to Representative Carter and then Representative Jordan, then we'll move to the next item. Representative Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned climate change, and you also mentioned the Midwest. I'm from Michigan, and last year we had substantial flooding. My concern is, according to what I've read, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that you have to participate in the NIP, uh, the National Flood Insurance Program, in order to, be, to purchase flood insurance. Have you evaluated these new areas that may have been affected by climate change and see whether or not they can participate? I'd be particularly interested if any area in Michigan is considered. So, uh, first of all, we've, uh, since the program started in 1968, one of the primary functions was to try to have every community that had land use authority to be a part of the, of the program and participate in the program. We're now at roughly 22,600 communities. So there, there's a small percentage of communities, uh, generally um, low in population in rural areas with limited resources that are not a part of the uh, National Flood Insurance Program. So we, can, we continue to work with, uh, with our, through our regional offices, with the states, in identifying those communities and seeing what we can do to assist them in becoming a part of the, uh, of the NFIP. Okay, thank you for that, but I'm specifically interested in finding out whether or not areas affected by climate change, like you mentioned, in the Midwest, and particularly Southeast Michigan that was hit very hard, whether or not they are participating in, in, in what is it, NFIP, okay? And if not, what can we do? Sure. So I would, I would suggest that climate change impacts uh, every part of our, of our country. 98% uh, of counties have had a flood event, a significant flood event, for example. And so I think it's across, uh, it's across the nation. Uh, I, can, uh, I can certainly take back, and I don't have the right in front of me what the, uh, what the participation rate is in, in, your, in your area. Uh, we certainly could find it, but I know the regional office in Chicago is, uh, has a good idea of where those areas are 
and have a strategy for trying to uh, address bringing them into the program. Thank you. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm really just trying to get some understanding because I've heard you say several times that, you know, we need to get more taxpayers into the program. And I, I know, as you're aware, in my state, in Louisiana, I mean, we've, we've had some issues with those risk rating 2.0 maps, and we're challenging those maps because it's led to a 234% increase in the, in the rates. So I, I, I guess in a state like Louisiana and Mississippi and others where we have some of the largest percentage of people living in poverty, I mean, you're giving us a 234% increase, but yet you're saying you want more people to participate in the program. To me, that just doesn't, I can't reconcile that, especially in a state where we have uh, limited access to carriers and homeowners insurance has risen by over 63% as well. And so we have a lot of people on citizens who is the insurer of last resort. Make me understand how you, you're making that request to somebody like me who has to go home and say, okay, we want you to participate, although the rate has increased by over 200%. Yeah, so a couple of points there, and thank you for, for raising, the, raising the issue. And, you know, first of all, our, uh, there needs to be a distinction between our new pricing methodology and the community the community flood insurance studies that determine where and how that community needs to be needs to be regulated. So our pricing methodology uh, utilizes those maps, but also utilizes a whole lot of other uh, other information. So there aren't any risk rating 2.0 uh, maps. Secondly, part of the benefit that we believe of the new pricing methodology is we, for the first time, have been able to show people what the full risk rate is for their specific property, not somebody else's, but theirs. And that information, we believe, is helpful for them to understand what their, what their risk is. If you're a current policyholder, you don't get a 234% increase. If you're a current policyholder, your policy can only increase 18% a year, not 63% or any other number, 18% a year. And unlike previously, that 18% glide path ends when your property reaches its full risk rate. So right now, roughly 30% of our policyholders are playing full risk rate, and so the risk premium stays level. We'll have, by year five, about 50% of our policyholders will be at that full risk rate. Year 10, about 90%. So unlike in the past, where premiums were going up every year, and would have continued to go up every year, um, the new program sets a, sets a limit or sets a cap. So I want to make two distinctions. One, if you're a new policyholder, you pay full risk rate, no longer do you come into the program discounted or subsidized. If you're a current policyholder, your policy can only increase 18% a year. Just, and just quickly though, but I, I get that, and I understand for the current, but you're asking new taxpayers to come in. And so for the ones who are currently there, I get it, the 18%. But if you're asking me to go back and say that we want new taxpayers to come in and participate in the program, mm -hmm. and they're paying at full rate, then... Yeah. So first of all, uh, my taxpayer comment was uh, to try to illustrate that the policyholders, rev the revenue that we receive from the policyholders can't alone support the program. So we need taxpayer, federal taxpayer support since a federally backed, uh, backed program. Relative to the new policyholders having to pay their full risk rate, we believe more information is better. But most importantly, that's why it's critical that we have support for the affordability plan that we've put in place that is a means-tested premium assistance program that would start, our proposal is to start at 120% of average mean income. As your income goes down, the percentage of your, uh, percentage of your uh, support would, would, would go up. It's been in the President's budget the last three years, and a key to the issue that you're talking about is having that affordability plan adopted. Thank you, David. Thank you for your presentation, for answering our questions. We look forward to seeing you next year when you will come back and report that you are debt-free. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Our last item on the agenda, uh, we're going to have a discussion about the Mental Health Parity Model Act. This is sponsored by Kentucky Representative Rachel Roberts, and Representative Roberts is going to kick it off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm uh, very proud to sponsor this model. It contains a number of provisions that I believe are very important and worthy of, um, of our discussion time here. We had a great session focusing on mental health care at our last meeting in July. Um, and since that time, you know, a lot of you reached out to me and gave feedback on that, on that hearing or on those discussions. And we really wanted to keep this conversation moving ahead and you know, work towards NCOIL adopting some model policies around these issues. The conversation initially started with a bill that I've been sponsoring in Kentucky, which requires insurance coverage for annual mental health wellness exams um, performed by a mental health professional. Well, I'm very um, passionate about that specific issue. This also seems to be an opportunity to broaden the conversation and to focus on other mental health care and behavioral issues. As a reminder, that conversation we had in July was really the first um, behavioral health uh, conversation and coils had in its history so I want to stress that this bill that's in your book today is really a starting point the cake is not baked here we have just opened the pantry to figure out what the ingredients are that we have to work with and very open to conversations around this and additions to this and co-sponsorship for this so as you can see on the first draft of the model law page on 352 of your binders uh, the annual mental health examination provision is on page 359. That's the original starting point of this. The other provisions are based on existing state law and deal with issues uh, such as medical necessity determinations and substance use disorder benefits, specifically establishing standards of care for substance use disorder care, uh, coverage parity, access to medications and treatments, removing some of the preauthorization and step barriers to those methods of care, and emergency care benefits. The conversation today, again, is meant to be a brief introduction and to frame some of these issues, and hopefully we can further develop this model throughout the year. And again, I encourage anyone with interest to please reach out to me as we continue these conversations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Roberts. With us today is Mr. Jim Broyles of the Ohio Psychological Association. Jim, welcome. Go ahead. Thank you. I am Dr. Jim Broyles. I'm with the Ohio Psychological Association. Uh, I'm the Director of Professional there, Affairs there. And my role is to work with our member psychologists, primarily on uh, uh, focusing on uh, working with insurance issues. So part of what I do is I hear from the, our member psychologists about any kind of concerns or issues they have uh, in working with uh, the insurance companies, which is the vast majority of our members. I also interact with my colleagues at the American Psychological Association who have a very similar role, and uh, I interact with uh, other behavioral health professionals here in Ohio, uh, the Social Workers Association, the Counselors Association, uh, and uh, uh, the Psychiatrists Association. And so I, I guess more, most importantly, what I'm saying is I hope that you will hear my comments as being pretty representative of behavioral health uh, professionals. I was, by the way, very encouraged to hear this conversation about the ERISA issue, which I also think is a really important issue uh, that we're facing, too, in a similar way. Um, so in general, we have a very favorable reaction to this model legislation. Uh, we feel like it is a very much needed next step in creating requirements, uh, parity requirements for the insurance industry. As you hear, what I want to do is I just want to go through some of the legislation and highlight some of the areas that we feel can be very helpful for us in, in facing and dealing with some of the problems that we encounter. Um, but in general, I guess what I ask you to do is think about, um, be, just be mindful of the idea that there are some very important access to care issues at stake in providing uh, behavioral health coverages, uh, coverage to our population. And in some cases, you know, these, uh, the access to care barriers can be there as a result of policies made by insurance organizations. Um, more and more behavioral health providers are leaving panels. And they, when, when I talk to them and ask them about their reason for that, we do regular surveys, and they state that it's due to administrative burden, uh, poor coverage frustration, and just general hassles and show, uh, associated with uh, policies that come from the insurance organizations. And we feel like this 
uh, piece of legislation addresses many of those. So I'll, I'll go through and just sort of highlight some of the areas that we feel like uh, are very helpful pieces of this uh, legislation. So in section one, number one, under the definitions, the generally accepted standards of, of mental health and substance use disorder care. Um, nice definition, finding the generally accepted standards is easier said than done. Uh, uh, but I will say that in many cases, those standards of care, many providers feel like their perspective, their understanding of what is the right standard of care is not always heard. And so the ending of this definition includes valid evidence-based sources uh, reflecting generally accepted standards of mental health and substance use disorder care include peer-reviewed scientific studies and medical literature recommendations from, of nonprofit health care provider professional associations and specialty societies. So that you can see there in that piece of the legislation that actually requires our voice to be uh, heard in creating these standards of care. And we think that could be very helpful. Um, the, the, under the definitions, again, number two, the medical nece necessary treatment of mental health or substance use disorder. The topic of, mental, uh, of medical necessity is a very much hot topic among behavioral health providers. I think probably among all, all even physical health providers, too. Um, uh, the definition of medical necessity is far away from being clear to us about how uh, uh, insurance organizations define that and how they apply that. And most of us are feeling like some of that is being, uh, is not always uh, right up front for us. Um, uh, requiring the use of standards, criteria, and guidelines created by nonprofit professional organizations such as the American Psychological Association, very respected association, allows us again to have a very much needed voice in uh, the, uh, the creation of these definitions, um, or the definitions or the standards that are used. Section two, ensuring mental health and substance use disorder medical necessity determinations follow generally accepted standards of care. So under, uh, in that section there, under B, uh, it states an insurer shall not limit benefits or coverage for chronic or pervasive mental health substance use disorders to short term or acute treatment at any level of placement. So what we, what we find sometimes is that uh, ins insurance coverage for a condition can be limited if acute symptoms are not currently present. And what we know to be true is that many chronic conditions or pervasive conditions can often be, still be present, encouraging the, the reemergence of more difficulties later on but if those acute symptoms are not present, then uh, uh, access to insurance coverage can be denied. Um, section D, uh, in that section there, uh, that, that ends with, all denials and appeals shall be reviewed by a professional with the same level of education and experience of the provider requesting uh, the authorization. I can tell you that in many cases, denials can occur and we have no idea about the decision-making process or the level of training or experience for the, for the individual who's making that decision. So that's, that can be a very helpful uh, portion. Uh, section F, uh, uh, conducting the utilization review of all covered health care services and benefits for the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of mental health and substance use disorders in children, adolescents, and adults. An insurer shall uh, apply the criteria and guidelines set forth in the most recent versions of the treatment criteria developed by the Nonprofit Professional Association for the relevant clinical specialty. Again, the uh, very same reasoning there uh, it seems very important to us. So in other words, this gives us a voice in uh, uh, um, uh, creating or defining the standards that are being used um, by the insurance company. Uh, section H um, uh, addresses a really important problem that many behavioral health practices are, have, ha, are, you know, are having right now. You know, it talks about um, forbidding of rescinding or modifying authorizations for services rendered for any reason, particularly if it is later determined after the services are provided, the insurer makes a sub subsequent determination that it did not make an accurate determination of the insurer's or policyholder's eligibility. 
So I want to describe to you a, uh, a circumstance that is not uncommonly faced by behavioral health practices. So behavioral self health services can be rendered to an individual, treatment can be successful, and then a year later, two years later, depending on the circumstance, an insurance organization can say, hey, we found out that we weren't really covering that person or we shouldn't give you that authorization. And then at that point, funds can be uh, reclaimed from the uh, individual provider. And that can amount to hundreds or even thousands of dollars. And the important point in all of this to consider is this. Most behavioral health practitioners right now are uh, operating from their own private practice. These are small businesses. They cannot withstand a, what we, this, we call this a clawback. We, they cannot withstand a clawback that amounts to hundreds or even thousands of dollars. It imposes a really important financial burden on them. Um, Section J talks about actually applying, uh, you know, real penalties for, um, uh, for violations of the law, and we find that in some cases there's, there is not always the consequence that is needed for violations of the law. So, you know, that, that's really important for us too. In section three, ensuring coverage of mental health and substance use disorder benefits are at parity with medical and surgical benefits. Under number two, uh, it talks about um, evaluating each complaint to determine whether a parity violation occurred. Um, so please keep in mind, I'm asking you to keep in mind, that provider complaints or client, their client complaints or patient complaints are very often the only avenue that we have that allows us to bring a, a important issue to the attention of, uh, you know, an, an enforcement agency. So having that enforcement agency be required to look at not only what's going on with this individual complaint, but also whether or not this is a parity violation can be hugely helpful. Um, Section 5, mental health or substance use disorder, emergency care ben benefits. Um, we're just very much in favor of that. Uh, uh, that, that just seems very clear to us. Um, section six, uh, coverage of mental health wellness examinations. Um, the, the one question I that, guess that I had about this, and Representative Roberts and I had uh, talk, talked about this very briefly, is that we have a little bit of concern about that 45 minute time frame, and Representative Roberts said that it's a parallel to a law in Colorado, I believe, and so we're understanding that. Our concern with that is that it feels a little bit more like a practice guideline. We don't usually see those kinds of time limits happening in the law, so we're just bringing that up. And I suggested that maybe we have it up to 45 minutes to make sure that that's not being misinterpreted by an insurance organization. So I hope you're hearing that in general we are in favor of uh, this legislation, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Broyles. To the legislators, are there questions or comments? I don't see any. If you have any input, please contact uh, Representative Roberts or our, our staff. And thank you very much for your presentation. Is there any other business to come before our committee? I see none. Who would like to let us go home? We have a motion to adjourn. Second? Been seconded. All in favor say aye. I'd like to come back. If it carries, we stand adjourned. Yeah.